Hi, everyone. My name is Nenea Reeves. I'm CEO of TRIP, and I'm also going to moderate this panel focused on XR wellness. And I'd like the panelists that we have who have a broad range of experience in the space to introduce themselves very briefly so we can jump into a very substantive conversation. And uh, so let's start with Aaron. We'll go in alphabetical order. Thanks, Nenea. It's nice to see you. Nice to see you too. And happy new year. So everyone, I'm Erin Bogdavsky. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist and the founder of Thera Inc. Um, our technology provides live virtual reality counseling services using customizable avatar technology. Great, thanks, Erin. And we'll go to Brian next. Yes, it's actually pronounced Byron. Well, Byron, no sorry. No worries. <laughs> like uh, Lord Byron, <laughs> a very <exactly>. noble name. <laughs> I'm named after, uh, for it's my mom. Um, actually co-founder of Thera Inc. and uh, head of business development. Um, yeah, that's my role. Excellent, great. Nice to have you both here. And Leslie, tell us what you're doing on Meditation Mountain. Hi, yes, I'm Leslie Chinen and I am a business development specialist for Shaking Earth Digital, which is a, a development studio based in Iowa, and also the creator of Meditation Mountain in Facebook Horizon. Great. And Paige. Hello, I'm Paige Danzinger, the founding director of Better World Museum and the Horizon Art Museum. In both platforms, we use creative technology to create more resilience in individuals, groups, and communities. And what do you mean by both platforms? On which both platforms? Well, Better World Museum was a, a brick and mortar space for oh. over five years, a real live museum, but it also extends into two VR um, social platforms. Uh, that are accessible on multiple cross-platform devices and ways to access the museums in VR and out of VR. Great. And then there's two different museums. There's Better World Museum and Horizon Art Museum, two very different experiences. Interesting. So I want to just jump into what we think would be you know, a good takeaway for anybody who's watching this, we can assume that most people coming to it would be not only just interested in what we're doing, but what they could learn. Uh, as we've been deploying in this very early stage ecosystem of getting our products out into market, especially trying to raise funding, uh, you know, some of the challenges of not only being a founder in general, but then you focus on being working in a very nascent emergent audience, uh, uh, virtual reality, the device constraints, and then just throw in the hell of a last year we all <laughs> went through uh, and, and spinning a lot of plates. And so I wanted to really open it up from a business standpoint. What have you found to be the most challenging uh, getting your business up and running? And how did you solve for that uh, uh, in, in your deployments? Because I think a lot of, there's been a lot of fits and starts. VR was always going to explode in 2018 or first it was 2016. Now here we are 2021. And so I think that would be wonderful for a lot of the creators out there to hear. So if Aaron and Brian can start with Thera because you're up and running and see you're um, even selling device bundles on your site and, and getting into the clinical arena um, uh, with your offering. How has that been going for you? Yeah, so just um, uh, your question is like, what were the challenges? Um, mm -hmm. Like specifically with VR is about adoption. So on, 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 the, on the business side, we all know that VR has been really popular with gaming and watching movies and you know it's been always kind of never really been recognized on a public level level for medicine but it has been tested seriously in clinical contained environments and research centers so one of the challenges that we had was due to covid is the headsets were very hard to sell because of sanitization it's very uh, very hard to deploy that to 
medical institutions and also in public for public use. So what we did as a company, um, we already had the existing um, headset technology, like the actual app developed. And so what we did as a company to solve that problem is we pivoted and now the VR is streamable on all devices. Mm. And so we were able to scale a lot faster because of the contagion. And at the same time to meet the, um, the Thera, Thera Inc, uh, Thera VR is the VR component, but Thera Inc, we're a telemedicine company. Mm. So uh, one of the challenges was like, well, how are we gonna you know, provide telemedicine over a headset during COVID? It was mm. just, you know, it was too problematic. So right now we've solved that problem um, because you know the vaccination is coming out, but we what we did as a company is we had to like we had to look at alternatives on how how to stream the VR on other devices. Mm -hmm. And Byron, you can kind of chime in and explain how that process worked and how we got into the hospitals. Yes, actually, uh, that's true. Um, we we quickly realized that we needed to to pivot, and that was a really good decision for us. Um, one from uh, kind of a scalability standpoint, and then um, just from a safety perspective, especially when COVID first started, a lot of people will, were very scared about touching things and, and whatnot. Um, but I'll tell you that um, one of the things we found in looking at a market is that initially we were looking at kind of a B2C, just dealing with directly with clinicians. Mm -hmm. And as COVID kind of ramped up, we got a lot of inquiry from actually institutions, hospitals, schools um, really looking for a solution to kind of deploy telemedicine to outpatients and um, students and, and whatnot. And so we quickly realized that that was a, a market to focus on is actually hospitals. And, and currently uh, we just started initiated a contract with Dallas Children's Hospital. Uh, we, we have met with several um, major children's hospitals um, inquiring about what we have. And a lot of those hospitals have relationships with uh, school districts as well, mm -hmm. as we trying to find a way to to service the, the ever increasing population that's uh, dealing with anxiety right now, depression, suicide is on the rise, and we so we, yeah, we definitely quickly adapted our business model mm -hmm. really to to service the hospitals and larger facilities that were you know had really robust outpatient um, populations. So. Um, that was one pivot that we that we focused in terms of a business, and of course, uh, with being on multiple devices with crossplay, it it just was a a dream for their situation because a lot of their populations don't necessarily have headsets, but they all have cell phones or tablets or desktops. Right. Right, right. Uh, so that worked perfectly, uh, and we're still actually getting a lot of inquiry from individual clinicians as well. So we have an adaptive model in terms of pricing for larger uh, companies as well as individual practices as well. Well, I think one of the things that we're starting to see, especially this past year, where we used to think of our business very much like, this is the enterprise clinical lane and the consumer lane. And a lot of people were saying, you shouldn't launch consumer. I'm really glad we did <laughs> because we would have, uh, um, we were actually able to get into people's homes and help them. And so I think a lot of us have to start thinking about as we work on these digital therapeutic or digital wellness products, it's less about B2B and B2C. It's more, how do you get direct to patient? Mm -hmm. Patients, we have to go in home. So, you know, it's been a very interesting opportunity under the stress of these very abnormal conditions for all of us to innovate. And so Leslie, how did Meditation Mountain come out as uh, an experience and what are some of the insights that you've seen as far as how to support people with it? Right. So talk about, um, you know, being direct to consumer. Um, it actually came about, and I'm hoping that um, people can just indulge in this world. Um, right now, Horizon is in beta, so it's limited, but, you know, I just wanted to be out there um, for people just to spend as much time or as little time as they want. Um, I like to describe 
um, Meditation Mountain as a rustic park in which um, people can tune in to tune up. And um, there are different exercises um, around the park that people can participate in to find their um, true selves. And um, these aren't, these are pretty um, used exercises. I mean, I'm no therapist, um, but um, this came about because um, as with a lot of people, I took the time <laughs> this summer to kind of figure my life out and I was working with an executive coach and um, I've always been a, an avid yogi. So meditation and yoga movement was always a part of my life, but I felt like um, being in this uh, lockdown situation that I was kind of at an impasse, you know, I, I was just stuck here. So working with the coach and working on these similar exercises, I really had a breakthrough. And so that's where all of this came rushing through. And a lot of that um, was having to do with going outside of my comfort zone. Um, mm -hmm. Art, with, I'm not an artist, I'm not a graphic artist. I mean, Paige will tell you, I'm not a graphic artist <laughs> by any means. And so with Horizon, when I was first let in, I was actually very intimidated. And I, I was working on different things and just getting frustrated because it wasn't as perfect or as um, great or, you know, operating like all these other uh, worlds were. And um, once I had this breakthrough, then all of this just came rushing back. So Meditation Mountain is very imperfect, <laughs> much like life. And so I just want people to... Um, be able to find themselves and, you know, celebrate that because um, as we know, life is not um, necessarily going to be the roadmap <laughs> that we set out for it to be. So um, I just want people to have fun. And I think social VR um, is very um, important, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, my issue with social VR is that like on Zoom, I'm looking at all of you right now and I can get visual cues that kind of, you know, I have DNA and a whole construct mental models. I can read those con uh, social cues when I go into the current ways that avatars are created in VR, it doesn't give me that experience. So in many ways, I get more connection doing these Zoom experiences with people until we can get more realistic avatars that don't give me kind of an uncanny robot weirdo mm -hmm. response to it, do you know? And uh, so I have a hard time personally with the connection of it just yet, um, but mm -hmm. it's interesting. Paige, when you talk about uh, what you're building with your museums, are um, uh, how do you, connect that to wellness and and as you mentioned you said I think you said the building resilience wellness has always been a central part of our museum's mission mm. better world museum actually formed five years ago in 2014 as a survivor of domestic violence I had worked with a, a place making public art project where I was to select any nonprofit in my community, I chose the domestic abuse violence project and together with 65 survivors of domestic violence, we drew purple flowers in oh. on an iPad program in which I had created. At that time, I still had yet to ever put on a VR headset, but we used uh, Unity to import and create a room in which you could use like a Google Cardboard mm -hmm. and experience this empathy experience. This was really my very first time in using VR, but what happened next with VR was once I had an Oculus, I drew a flower using a drawing program and I posted it on social media, inviting anyone in the world to add to it. Mm. The, presidential election had just happened and people were 
were, you know, as tense as they are even today as we see this play out on our Capitol steps. And a person said, I just opened myself up to literally the worst of the internet. And I told them, no, trust in people. And first somebody in Ireland drew in the, in the VR garden and then somebody in California and somebody- and So that's in an interesting way to integrate social and community and still deal with the current state of technology. And I'm not saying it won't get to where, you know, we feel like it's really the metaverse and I can upgrade my avatar, et cetera. And it's a really good extension of who I am, but it, it's, you know, we're evolving. That's really innovative. Well, today over 4,000 people have participated and it has traveled live to countries Wonderful. all around the world where students and women and diverse members of communities have been able to participate. What it really does is it teaches valuable skills and levels playing fields. That's well, so let, let's an important jump, part of the museum. Let's jump to a couple of things that um, I would love to hear sort of, you know, open conversation with the group is, so you said 4,000 people. Oh, and, yes, actually. And Aaron, Aaron had mentioned adoption being kind of the issue. And those are small numbers in sort of the world of what you need to have happen to get ongoing investment. We've seen some very promising companies go away because they couldn't get the market traction that we need. And um, so, you know, what what, how do we solve this problem of adoption? I love what Aaron and Byron were saying about, you know, scaling out, pivoting to more screens. This is something we've seen the wave do really well as well. And um, I think in order for VR to get the support that it needs to grow, you know, it has to have a much larger audience. And so even today I was trying to figure out you know, the DAU to MAU metric that you have in mobile, what's the equivalent in virtual reality? Because it's not like we're carrying the device around in our pockets, you know, all day long. So should it be a DAU to MAU metric or should it be weekly active users to, you know, is it more of a weekly usage? What are the usage patterns you're seeing? I mean, we, you know, we've just crossed a million sessions. Um, so we have an audience that's pretty much at scale on Oculus, which just launched on PlayStation, but it's still small compared to what I've seen in the video game industry, right? And, and it's hard to generate a lot of excitement. I think having a sense of cross accessibility is really important to building a, a more mass adoption. For instance, this summer during COVID, Better World Museum really proliferated in Rec Room, a platform known for its youth audience and culture. Right. At a time when really young people were out of school and sitting at home or on their PlayStations, they were also able to access um, and develop leadership roles. These leadership roles were actually um, presented at the World Health Organization at a format uh, uh, about COVID and arts as a recipe for resilience during mm -hmm. the pandemic and as a way to build resilience amongst a climate. I live in Minneapolis, so all around me, my city was building. And while that was happening, we were having active, um, active experiences and social activism within museums happening in VR. And at a time when museums were closed, over 800 new users visited Better World Museum just in rec room. So, but even still, I mean, that those it's still very, very early stage nascent and wonderful to get that kind of adoption, especially. Um, but 
you know, when you are, I'd love to hear from Aaron and Byron, how are you thinking about provider adoption at scale and uh, how the, how to work with the insurance entities? Um, uh, I know many are interested in subclinical offerings, but are, are you looking at, you know, going through an FDA clearance, 510K class two, um, you know, software as a medical device? approach to what you're doing or, uh, you know, and also how are you working with the providers? Where are you seeing the hiccups as well as the insurance and how they're thinking about coding? Yeah, so um, to answer both of your questions, so we are under the breakthrough medical device um, applications. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that, and it's slightly different than the other companies in this panel is that we're not a product, right? So it's we're we're the provider so mm -hmm. we we are a telemedicine platform so it's about telehealth and so yes we work we work with insurance so we bill under the cpt codes mm -hmm. um, for psychotherapy and so within our company itself under the medical group our existing cl clinicians including myself we use this on our patients mm -hmm. and there's a really big differentiating factor here you use the word users, we, they're, they're patients. Mm -hmm. So it's a really big difference. So we're not gonna have like a million people using TheraVR, like, cause it's not, a, it's not a product. It's more gonna be like in the thousands, right? Because when, when you're working with a hospital, they have their patient flow. Like within, um, so when you're integrating the technology, it's based on whatever institution and what numbers that they're seeing based on like, um, their their um, service of care, if, if it's outpatient or mm -hmm. convergent care or in, inpatient, that's a different system of care. In our group, scaling to, um, I guess you would call this B2C, so private, private practitioners, so private practice. Again, it's a little different, right? Are they gonna be seeing patients in private practice, you know, continuously in VR? No, it's, it, that's not realistic. Right. It has to, it has to be kind of interchangeable. So that qualifies under telemedicine. So that's why we can, we can bill under insurance because it's live streaming. It's basically, it's modifier 95, but we're doing mm -hmm. this through VR. And so actually um, Thera, Thera VR is uh, a member of the American Telemedicine Association. And so- Did you have, have to- take your um, VR product, did you have to integrate it into a QMS system or anything um, in order to be compliant? No. No. Mm -mm. What we have is it's basically provider and patient. It's a portal and mm -hmm. it's encrypted and the um, it's clinician driven. So the clinician is guiding and starting the session. The sessions are timed based on um, whatever CPT code the clinician is allocating for, like right. for psychotherapy, and then it stops. So it's very standardized. So it's not like you just like put on the headset and the app's just running, right? It is a scheduled encrypted session. And then we also, um, in order to use TheraVR, you have to have credentials. So the the, the system generates a private login and password, which protects the patient and it protects the, pri the, the provider. So you can't just use this, you know, commercially. It's Got it. And I think that's important for patient safety. And um, it's all about we're patient. very conscientious about delineation of our consumer offering, which is just more mindfulness in its approach. And then mm -hmm. some of the more targeted therapeutic offerings that we have going through mm -hmm. uh, research and approval paths. But the um, uh, thing that I've been wondering also, and I'd love to hear from all the panelists on this is, you know, we have some really cool new devices coming where we can capture biosensor or biosignal data from sensors specifically the eye trackers um, where, you know, with pupil changes, you can get cognitive load responses, stress responses, valence, 
this is a whole new world. And if you read Jeremy Balenson's recent study that he was involved in where they could it, it identify the individual just by movement in VR with 40 second, uh, I think it was like 40 seconds worth of data mm -hmm. and that it was actually kind of a privacy exposure. Um, obviously there's some ethics that we all have to think about and um, you know what you were talking about, the sessions being encrypted, I think triggered that question for me. And I'd lo love to hear some thoughts about the device landscape, what you're most excited about. Um, we're working on the Unreal glasses, which look really cool. Um, and mm -hmm. they even have a VR cover on them mm -hmm. that you can snap on. Um, uh, you know, the, if you read the rumors about Apple's devices, if they do auto focusing um, for vision correction. And mm -hmm. so the, um, I'm excited about a future where computing moves from the hand to the head. But you know, how are you thinking about adapting your experiences and services, your platforms? We consider ourselves a platform as well um, in the way that it's constructed. But um, yeah, would just love to hear thoughts on device mm -hmm. landscape. Yeah, inter integration is really important. That's really amazing the how Trip has done that in terms of. Um, your clinical trials and you know going through the SBIR grants and stuff because then mm -hmm. you can get that critical data that's so needed. Right. And um, yeah, the work that comes out of Stanford in the the virtual rea reality lab, like Jeremy's lab, is fantastic because it's he's tested on so many different populations. Like mm -hmm. and going back to the avatar technology, when you go into TheraVR, the avatars are very responsive. So as a clinician, I can I can have a fairly accurate reading of my patient when they're why can't we get that into some of the avatar systems that are in like these consumer products? Because you know, I don't want to be a triangle. I don't right? know. Like <laughs> don't find what you're saying. Not 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 on my watch. No. Yeah, and my, the thing is like with the the whole reason why I created the avatar customization is as a provider, you know, I, you know, I used to work with at-risk youth and very, um, you know, very high risk, like for suicide and self-harming. And it's terrifying for them to like see their doctor or to, mm. to see this authority figure in front of them. So the whole concept is, well, well let, let's make, let's make it comfortable for them. Let's make it safe. Safety, but, psychological safety. So it's not just the space that they're going into, it's, mm -hmm. it's also like, well, hey, you, you have the honest to change me and not just well, that. Looking at all of, all of you, I think that's what you've all kind of taken in your approach of using XR is to create these containers of psychological safety, mm -hmm. whether it's working with, you know, um, uh, battered women or, uh, you know, you, wanting to connect to yourself on, on these beautiful little mountains and uh, yeah, or right. even maybe giving a clinician. I love what Skip Rizzo, and I know he's one of your advisors, had communicated when he did some of his research that he found that veterans were more honest mm -hmm. in some ways where they could express things that they didn't feel the judgment of a human right. from. That, well, that's, that's interesting. That's, that's very true. Um, so in... PTSD is a, a very complex diagnosis and with, um, and everybody knows that, you know, it's, it's 22 vets commit suicide a day, mm -hmm. a day. And so what Skip's research has done and his creation of brain mind is it, it's, it's a preventative tool. Mm -hmm. It's, and it's fantastic because you can use VR and avatar technology to do a lot of good. Mm -hmm. instead of looking at it with judgment it's like oh okay I, can't, I don't you know I can't make eye contact or whatever that's these are things that we can improve with the design and development of the, the actually the coding you know with, with the headsets are getting getting more sophisticated but sure. but in terms of actually the social experience for someone that has that diagnosis mm -hmm. it's all about um, creating safety and Got trust it. Right. And that you can't get that from, you know, 
a, a traditional office visit because sure. they can follow the office. And that that was the that was the brilliant thing about Brave Mind for treating um, PTSD, but also his avatar um, creations that you know just doing an interview for a job. Right, right, that, sure. This fantastic, and we—that's what we're testing right now with. Yeah, and yards. to be clear, I wasn't looking at it with judgment. It was just more how it made me feel. I haven't, I have yet to have an experience in social VR where I actually felt a real connection. Mm -hmm. you know? I have, and been, I have felt connections to environments, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and um, but I haven't yet, and that's just me. It's not. Yeah you know, judging yeah. avatars as oh, no, it totally makes sense. It's like, it, it's all based on um, populations too. children, children feel a lot more connected because they, they, they grew up gaming, right? They grew up like having an avatar yeah, me too. and they, <laughs> they, yeah, they, they, they feel very comfortable with it. And like people our age is like, no, I don't really feel that connection. Right. And it's, oh, I'm, I'm a first generation gamer. Oh. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess remember like super Mario and stuff. Right. Yeah. And that no, was, no. <laughs> yeah. I think, I, think yeah. I personally think that's where the opportunity is. That's what I get excited about because a lot of calls we have, the, the you know chief innovation officers or the directors of these hospitals are saying, okay, this looks really cool. It's a great application platform, but are people really going to want to use this? Are my clinicians going to want to use this? Are are patients going to want to use this? And why? Why VR? Right. So yeah, why sort of VR? I mean, that's the question we always ask our team. Right? Why do I want to put a headset on to have this experience? This is why I'm not. He, we didn't focus on simulated environments because, you know, I can go sit on my balcony and meditate without like something heavy on my head. And so can I trigger awe? Can I trigger some other kind of thing that you can't have here? And mm. um, so one question I have, and this goes to um, all of you as well. Um, uh, how do we measure the impact of what we're doing, do you know? And this is kind of going back to, I was trying to figure out what's our DAU to MA, our daily active user to our monthly active user ratio. And um, uh, how do we t find out if people are really responding to our experiences and uh, we're capturing a lot of data, um, but it's still kind of an unknown and we're creating these wonderful containers, but how do we measure psychological safety? And how does that vary from one individual to the other? And as Aaron had mentioned, one cohort to the other, right? One population to the other. And Paige, you, you've been, I think probably out of all of us, maybe working in this space the longest. Is that accurate? I mean, I built my first VR product in 2015. Okay. Yeah, um, I've I've been in in working with resilience through creative technology for for a long time. Mm. But, but I also we we so one question on that to get, keep on topic: How do you measure resilience? Yeah, so we we do it in several different ways. Actually, in in the museum, we would do it in ways where. Where people were able to put stickers uh, on on data posters, right? Oh, how and cool! How they're feeling, right. they feel vulnerable or excited, or if they tried something new. But in VR, what we're doing these days is well, um, we do generate a lot of in VR uh, deep connections with people of all ages, a lot mm -hmm. of teens and a lot of. Uh, peers my own age and younger, but we try to capture testimonials. So mm. I'll ask um, like Leslie, for instance, just was a member of our Plus Community Voices program. She, um, if I may say in a, a moment that she, Leslie was able to contribute her perspective on a work of art. And then I recorded Leslie having the experience where she's testing it in the museum for the very first time and responding to it and just capturing 
those moments where they our participants first hear their voice amplified as a voice of authority throughout the museum is is very elevating and mm -hmm. they don't even have to say oh my gosh i just went through abc and had this moment but but even just capturing them going oh, or right it, it's part of of um seeing we feel as though Bessel van der Kolk talk, talking about post-traumatic stress uh talks about getting it out of your body right of, of moving it out of of your physical being so we do a lot of like painting with texts or or broad stroking movements within vr when we're building intentionally mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to release some of that that um trauma within the body right now there's none among us who are not experiencing these traumas mm -hmm. uh, whether it's COVID related or co colonization related or corruption or climate, right? So we're all dealing with huge existential crises that we hold inside of us. One reaction that we had though, right after um, in the month um, from the moment of the brutal police murder of George Floyd in my community, from that first week on for a month, I was creating these VR videos of painting, um, painting fear, painting monsters, painting joy, painting autonomy. There's a, a very long playlist and the reactions to those videos help also then with um, metrics, uh, reactions, uh, testimonies, sure. and how it impacts people. So I'm being a little mindful of time because we've been going for uh, about 30 minutes or so. And um, uh, I want to make sure that we also have the opportunity to express what we're most excited about as well. Um, but Leslie, before we move on to that, can you tell us a little bit about how you're thinking about the evolution of Meditation Mountain? Like you've got it stood up. Uh, and I love that you spoke about how it came from your own sort of personal transformation and what do I want to do? And, and then you actually went and built something, which is so awesome. But what are you thinking? How does it evolve for you or or not? Is it something that you take away with you as having done? And um, no, actually, um, it, it is a big feat for me that I actually published, that I actually hit publish. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there are so many times when I thought, okay, this isn't perfect. How do I make this look like this? And, you know, um, but, um, but again, it, it just goes back to, it's, it's imperfect, like life. So um, I do hope that eventually, you know, um, people can um, use it as just a space, just, you know, before they hop into whatever they're creating, maybe just visit and just take a breath. Um, if they're in Horizon, um, I would like to hold, um, simple yoga classes there. I finally mm -hmm. got yoga bottoms up. So <laughs> we have that. Um, they can just attach to, you know, like sitting poses, standing poses. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, um, it is my first world. Um, so I would like, you know, people to just kind of take whatever they want from it. Um, and it, with what Paige has said, it's definitely helped me. I'm not, I don't have a visual effects background at all. So um, Horizon makes it very easy to work with lighting and, and um, you know, just different animations and what have you. And um, this summer <laughs> has been a very um, a tragic um, situation. In addition to the pandemic, I had a couple of deaths in my family. So, um, you know, it, it's really kind of helped me to, to grieve um, because I've been able to um, kind of create and I'm um, right now working on um, 
recreating my um, aunt's house and at her house, that's where we would gather for the holidays. So mm -hmm. um, it was hard not to do that this year, but then also knowing that going forward, we won't be doing that. Um, and so I think that for people who are interested, that's what I love about XR. You don't have to have these specific um, developer backgrounds or this, you know, visual effects background. Um, you can find your way through it just with whatever you um, come into it with. I mean, my background's in journalism and PR mm -hmm. marketing. <laughs> so that's kind of as far as you can get. So is that, is that also kind of your answer to what you're excited about in the XR wellness space that you can... Uh, definitely, definitely. See yourself building mm -hmm. experiences and yeah. maybe even connecting to what's important to you through that. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, people know that art is a great way to um, channel their emotions. And, um, you know, with different programs, uh, different apps, um, they can do that. Um, and also um, to be able to um, engage with other people, whether it's through um, gameplay or just, you know, being in a space together, um, that is what I'm most excited about because um, if I didn't have the social aspect of VR, I think um, this uh, pandemic would be very different for me. Um, I just, I love that I'm able to meet friends and colleagues in VR and, you know, we're all from different parts of the um, city as well as the nation. So um, that's, I think a great part of the um, experience that XR can give in terms of wellness. Mm -hmm. Great. How about you, Paige? When you look to the future next four or five years, what are you uh, most excited about? What, what are your predictions for the space of XR wellness and healthcare? I'd really like to see um, uh, more development with diverse leaders leading those voices in wellness mm -hmm. I, and leadership within a health uh, trajectory. I think that the more voices that we have, uh, the more pathways to wellness we have for more people. And we're at a wonderful time to broaden um, more as as social VR widens, uh, more voices will have access to that. And There's so many female leaders in XR, right? There's so many female developers and creators, and that's encouraging. And as someone who's multi-ethnic, um, I think about you know different points of view as well. But yeah, I love that statement, Paige. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Byron, what are you what are you excited about? Well, I'll take a, a page from page. <laughs> and uh, I will um, echo those sentiments because what, what I'm excited about, just kind of being, uh, especially on the business development side, in terms of um, the opportunity, the scalability, you know, whether it's um, limited VR kind of communities or those just focus on therapy. I think as more awareness, especially among disenfranchised groups come for mental health, right. also VR and the technology and the explosion of just discounted headsets and the excitement around gaming. I embrace all of that because ultimately you're gonna have a lot more adoption participation yeah. and you're gonna have a lot more people explore and find out just how this new immersive technology can impact and bring healing, bring connection. It's interesting as I look at the just alarming statistics um, of mental health and suicide, and I've, and I've been involved in more so in that space than specifically VR over the last mm -hmm. decade. Um, I'm just really encouraged by um, how technology has improved. Depression has gone up, but we can use technology to kind of reverse that. Mm -hmm. And and as we have more connected devices, we're less connected, right? This is kind of an oxymoron. 
But right. how can we reverse that and use the technology to bring more connection? That's those exactly. are the things. Those are the things I'm excited about, and more inclusion. And I and I hope to represent uh, brown folks well, and kind of, you know, being a champion to kind of um, put the word out there about just how um, effective this can be in bringing. And you can't this. be what you don't see. And I've worked with many large tech organizations, and I. Um, can honestly say I've only worked with three African American coders. You know, not that we didn't want to hire. It's just you know, getting the talent available yeah, and brought in the pool. So currently, our chief technology officer is also a brown person, and mm -hmm. he works with quite a bit of people in India and around the world. So we're very diverse, and we're led by a fierce leader, Aaron, a female. So yeah. Um, so we we have a lot about it, and I've been on a lot of these rooms, and a lot of women are involved, which I was yes. surprised about. And I'm well, very once it becomes big business, they're going to try to push us out, but we're going to be a fierce <laughs> army because <laughs> that's what happened even in computer programming, right? It was all, right. It was all women. That's yeah. right. Yeah, we're gonna we're we're I'll already be, doing be, our be, part. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you for uh, representing Byron. Aaron? Yeah, I just, um, I just wanted to commend everybody else on the panel. It's so exciting to hear your passion. And um, uh, I'm, I'm really excited and I'm, I'm coming, like I don't have the tech background. I'm, I'm a healthcare, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. And when I came into VR, I actually saw it as a tool to connect people together like mm. doctors and patients. So I'm excited about creating a new chapter in telemedicine. I'm excited about integrating other companies that are existing um, healthcare providers like Air Visits, 911 um, Telemedicine uh, and Elite HRV, which is our biometrics measurements for heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. I'm excited at that how VR we can integrate other companies to provide a, a real safe and credible experience to improve patient outcomes. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm so excited about, that we can, we can actually reduce the cost of you know, medicine, unnecessary visits to the emergency room. What, whatever, whatever it can actually make an impact economically on the healthcare industry because yeah. COVID has wrecked us. It's yeah. wrecked our economy. It's, it's a burden to our healthcare system right now. We don't have enough providers in the hospitals to, to treat patients. We have to, VR, HealthXR is a fantastic tool to solve these problems. Trip, you can have this in your home and it's it's a it's a fantastic problem solving tool, right? And we, we've over, seen a yeah. lot of that love from people during the past year. Um, what I guess I think about a lot is, um, you know, as I mentioned before, using tech for good purposes. Mm -hmm. You know, and all the things we know how to. You know, if you just think about how you can make someone feel bad about themselves so badly that they have to buy a product, mm -hmm. right? change themselves. And pharma has definitely done that in many ways with um, uh, medicine and uh, how we can use this to make people feel more empowered so they have agency mm -hmm. over taking care of themselves. But I think probably the biggest thing I've been the most excited about recently is the stigma around taking care of your mental well-being mm -hmm. and mental health, even for those who don't have a mental illness diagnosis, you know, to realize we are living under unprecedented times, the stress, mm -hmm. the information flow of and what that does to our mental well-being. Mm -hmm. And that there's this community of people like yourselves you know, contributing to solutions that can help support people. I think it's an incredible opportunity for us as founders to not only um, make a contribution and make a difference in people's lives, but also that we can contribute in, in uh, driving some real innovation 
-hmm. you know? And so just getting experiences up and running and experimenting like what Leslie did or what Paige has been doing and how that scales, you know, it's just getting that first thing out there. Mm -hmm. And then as you said, maybe, maybe it isn't just tens of thousands or thousands of deployments so you you might find oh wow here's the idea that scales this much bigger as well and gets more impact so anyway well i um want to thank you for a wonderful conversation and wish you all a very happy successful year and maybe next ces we can do this uh we'll do the sequel in person would be I think the most fun ever. Uh, or Good. second to that, we're going to use your avatar system, <laughs> and we'll meet on Meditation Mountain or in the yes. uh, in Meditation Mountain. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.